Morning, ladies and gentlemen. For today's CPC, we have a very interesting case: 70 year old male who has a complex liver issue with the cryptococcal meningitis. We have uh, Dr. Asta, associate professor from Department of Neurology, to discuss the clinical profile. Asta. Thank you, sir. A very good morning to all. I'll be reading out the CPC protocol for today. The patient's name was BRS. He was a 70 years old male. Uh, the chief complaints were that the patient presented with left-sided hemiparesis on 7th of March 2022 and the background of a febrile illness of 10 days duration and altered mental status for two days duration. The history of present illness was that the patient was a known case of chronic liver disease with portal hypertension and secondary hemochromatosis since 1991 and 1992. And he presented now with intermittent history of fever with spikes up to 102 degrees Fahrenheit, no specific localization signs for fever were there, and after 10 days of fever, he developed sudden onset left hemiparesis. It was noted on waking up in the morning, left lower limbs were more involved than the upper limbs, the weakness was maximal and at onset, and was associated with slurring of and mild facial deviation. The patient was managed in IGMC Shimla initially, and he was discharged in an MRS3 status, Two days post-discharge, the patient developed progressively worsening sensorium and the patient presented TBI. There's a very significant background history to this patient. The patient uh, from 1991 was a diagnosed case of uh, chronic liver disease. The patient was having unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. The first presentation was with eight months history of this hyperbilirubinemia. There was hyperpigmentation, osteoarthritis, no cholestasis and no hemolysis at that time. Of the liver biopsy was done because of doubtful diagnosis, and the first liver biopsy revealed that they were iron-laden hepatocytes. The patient gradually developed anemia. Uh, the patient was requiring phlebotomies and chelation in 1992 to 2005, but after that, the patient started to require blood transfusion for the hemolytic anemia which he developed. Over time, he lost to follow up in between, and 2016, he again presented with history of decompensation of the liver disease. He was having portal hypertension with grade two, grade three varices. The patient was at this time worked up again. The patient was still having hyper, uh, unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Endoscopic variceal ligation multiple times had to be done, and the hemolytic anemia was being managed by uh, repeated blood transfusions. The liver uh, biopsy was repeated in the view of unclear diagnosis, again showing hemochromatosis. There was mild photal fibrosis and pseudomelanin pigment deposits in the liver as well. 2018, the patient was found to again have worsening of his hemolytic anemia. Again, he was worked up for hemolysis. Direct Coombs test was negative. DNA analysis for the known mutations for hereditary hemochromatosis were absent. Ferritin was almost normal, 140 to 400 nanograms per ml for around two to three years. His chelation was stopped in 2019. 2021, he again presented with pedal edema. Despite, uh, so at this time with pedal edema, he was diagnosed to be having atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate and 2D echocardiography showing by atrial enlargement. The patient was treated for portal hypertension, again repeated transfusions and recurrent anemia, and he was now also being managed with anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate. 2021-22, sorry, 2021 November, he again presented with worsening anemia, and this is the time when he was treated as immune uh, uh, hemolytic anemia. The patient was given steroids at high dose, mycophenolate, mofetil, and azathioprine at very high dose, subsequent to which the patient developed fever, and the patient presented with focal neurological deficits and altered sensorium. It was somewhere in January 2022 that the report of next generation sequencing had come, which was suggestive of uh, uh, hereditary xerocytosis, which will be discussed subsequently. Personal history was not significant, even the family members were tested uh, subsequent to the report of next gen sequencing, which was all negative. On presentation, the patient was having a status of E2, E2, and M5. There was pallor and ictris, which was present, and the patient was febrile almost throughout his uh, duration of admission. Uh, abdomen, the patient was having heptomegaly and splenomegaly. On CNS examination, the patient was having neck rigidity, signs of meningismus, and the patient was having left hemiplegia with bilateral extensive uh, plantar. The power was not mentioned in the file, but probably it was a dense hemiplegia the way the notes had gone. So investigations, the key investigations were that the patient was always having anemia, the patient was given multiple blood transfusions in between, but still the maximum hemoglobin which was recorded was that of eight. Uh, regarding leukocyte count, uh, the leukocyte count had increased in between, but terminally the patient's leukocyte count was again low. It was a polymorpho predominant uh, leukocytosis, polymorphocytosis. Reticulocyte counts were high. 
the platelets are the platelets were almost in normal range urea creatinine were normal initially but pre terminally the patient developed acute kidney injury the bilirubin specifically the unconjugated bilirubin was always high with normal enzymes of the liver the crp was high the procalcitonin was very high the patient's uh, ultrasound doppler again showed uh, hepatosplenomegaly Uh, and the portal vein diameter was 9 mm blood culture was repeatedly sterile pro bnp was high and thyroid profile was normal the csf analysis which was done repeatedly at least it was done twice it was showing 93 cells the proteins were 78 and the antigen for cryptococcus cryptola was positive repeatedly the patient's comb test was done which was negative the g6pd hemoglobin electrophoresis everything was done including viral markers and everything came out to be negative interestingly the patient cd4 count which was connected uh, posthumously was hardly 5.6% i mean if corrected for the real value it was hardly 50 or 60 in total now i invite dr prashant to tell us about the ngs findings thank you dr astha good morning this patient had represented a medical mystery to the hematology side for over 20 years he had been worked up extensively initially for hereditary hemochromatosis mutations which were all negative and subsequently when he developed reticulocytosis and these stomatocytes and uh, circulating nrbcs these are the stomatocytes these are the re early retics uh, he had an extensive hemolytic anemia work up in 2022 uh, when the uh, ngs was introduced for patient care by our uh, subsequent to the introduction he underwent this and this revealed the correct diagnosis he had a variant in the pso gene which is a mechanosensitive rbc channel with very pleiotropic effects he was heterozygous for this dominant disorder he also had contributing mutations that were uh, adding to his jaundice and the hemolysis so this was then confirmed as is the norm on sanger sequencing this mutation has been reported uh, this variant has been reported previously as pathogenic in at least two other patients and therefore it clinched his diagnosis and explained uh, at least at that point all his antemortem manifestations thank you i would always also request uh, dr chirag to tell us about the imaging findings and that thank you dr asa yeah so uh, in september of uh, 2021 he had an mri abdomen which was a truncated a uh, short mri abdomen probably looking at the uh, condition of the liver and the spleen so there was uh, significant features of crd in the form of lobulated margins they on t2 uh, weighted imaging there was significant hypointensity in the liver suggestive of increased iron deposition at the same time there is significant splenomegaly which was measuring about 16 cm in cranio caudal dimension there have been, there were no significant uh, collaterals in the porta hepatis Uh, there were presence of stones in the dilated gallbladder suggestive of cholelithiasis and also presence of some hypointense nodules within the spleen suggestive of sclerotic nodules which we refer to as gamma gyni bodies and the biliary system was essentially normal so in a background of chronic liver disease he had splenomegaly with gamma gyni bodies and also cholelithiasis so uh, at the time of presentation he was carrying an ncct and a mri uh, of the brain the non contrast ct of the head shows presence of this hypotensity in the right basal ganglia as well as a distinct small hypotensity in the left uh, globus pallidus as well there was some element of uh, ventriculomegaly however because we didn't have contrast we couldn't really comment on the meningitis so there were infarcts in the territory of the basal ganglia the mri brain which he was carrying also showed similar uh lesions in the form of basal ganglia flare hyperintensities which showed significant restriction on diffusion weighted imaging indicating that the uh, there was cytotoxic edema here indicating that they, uh, these were ultimately infarcts so a ct at the time of admission at pgi revealed subtle increase increase in the hypotensity uh in the same areas uh, however the ventricular system is more or less of the same uh, size and nature the sulcal spaces are also normal there was no other lesion appreciated in the supratentorial brain parenchyma mri obviously was done at the same time which shows presence of this subtle t2 hyperintensity in the left cerebellum and these infarcts are uh, better appreciated on the t2 axial imaging and the infarcts have actually increased but the predominant pattern is the ganglionic pattern there is mild ventriculomegaly the sulcal spaces are normal no other lesion is seen in the rest of the brain to uh, important to notice there is significant thickening of the calvarium uh, indicating an underlying uh, uh, disease in the form of uh, increased sclerosis of the calvarial bones and possibly extramedullary hematopoiesis so these are the t1 uh, non contrast images no significant uh, problems here but contrast shows 
enhancement along these very very subtle enhancement along the uh, anterior surface of the brain stem enhancement along the cerebellar folia in, uh, and we could identify the infarct also here and these lesions in the ganglion in the ganglionic region was showing peripheral enhancement but were more suggestive of subacute nature of the infarcts however at this point small lesions which we uh, typically see with cryptococcus cannot be entirely excluded here and the coronal depiction of the same lesion, but there was no significant convexal meningeal enhancement, no significant hydrocephalus that was appreciated. And these were the lesions which showed diff uh, diffusion restriction, cerebellar lesion. Uh, there was a, a small lesion in the brainstem as well, higher up in the centrum semiuvil, and this is the predominantly ganglionic uh, lesion. So there were no hemorrhages associated. So in a setting of meningitis with ischemic lesions scattered in bilateral basal ganglia, which was a predominant pattern also uh, in centrum semiveal cerebellum and brainstem, we considered a possibility, a strong possibility of cryptococcosis. However, tubercular meningitis, because the patient had a low CD4 count, uh, he may not mount a meningeal inflammation, inflammatory reaction as we, as we usually see with basal dominant meningitis. So tuberculosis cannot be entirely excluded. Yeah, atypical bacteria like nocardia can be cared, but I would stick to my diagnosis of cryptococcus. And there was diffuse calvarial thickening. So he also had chest X-ray during ad admission. This is 24th of March. There were signs of uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, mild prominence of the hyla. The CP angles more or less are fine, but there was increased bronchovascular marking in the lung fields on both sides. Over a period of four days, 24 to 28th March, he uh, developed an, a right-sided uh, opaque hemithorax with pleural effusion, some uh, areas of breakdown. So the pos but the left lung was essentially normal. So what we considered was progressive edema with uh, right-sided consolidation and pleural effusion. Possibilities were aspiration pneumonitis, pulmonary hemorrhage, and maybe everything is infected. But asymmetry is uh, against this. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So the, uh, after this, the course in management of this patient, so he was a 70 years old gentleman who had known case, who was a known case of hereditary xerocytosis, chronic liver disease and portal hypertension and hemochromatosis. He had atrial fibrillation and he was on dibigaptin when he was admitted to PGI. He was admitted in a E2, V2, M5 status and because of this infarct, he was started on low molecular weight heparin. Um, in the background of AF and uh, fast ventricular rate, a cardioembolic stroke was considered first. Subsequently, antibiotics, amphotericin B, flu cytosine was given for meningo, suspected meningoencephalitis. Atrial fibrillation was managed with amiodron, deltiazem, metoprolol, and later DC cardioversion. Mild improvement was noted after 20 ml CSF tap was done, but the patient developed uh, respiratory distress acute kidney injury for which even dialysis was done, severe sepsis the patient had developed subsequently, and metabolic acidosis. He developed refractory hypertension and could not be revived despite all efforts and was declared dead at 9.30 p.m. on 30th March 2022. The unit's final diagnosis was hereditary xerocytosis with cryptococcal meningitis, with vasculitis, with multiple strokes, in the background of chronic atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate and a background of chronic liver disease, portal hypertension, and secondary hemochromatosis. And the cause of death was given to be aspiration pneumonitis, severe sepsis, and acute kidney injury. I move on to my protocol now. So this... So I would uh, want to consider the background or the medical history of this patient into these four phases. The first phase being the hepatic phase when the patient was having hemochromatosis and predominantly unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. The second phase was when the patient showed signs of uh, hemolytic anemia. And while the patient was receiving phlebotomies earlier, the patient shifted on to receiving transfusions now. The third phase was the cardiac phase, in which the patient started to develop cardiac conduction defect and was considered to be having atrial fibrillation and biatrial enlargement, which may have been suggestive of restrictive cardiomyopathy. And finally, after receiving immunosuppression, the patient presented with an altered sensorium. So uh, even despite a very long medical history of this patient, there were many questions which were challenged or which were uncertain. A few of them are, what was the liver diagnosis? What was the hepatic diagnosis for this patient? What was the correct cause of iron overload? Why did the patient develop unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia even before the patient developed a clinical anemia? So much so that the patient was, rec was receiving multiple episodes of, uh, he had to undergo phlebotomies. 
what was the cause of hemolytic anemia, cardiac involvement, and subsequently, what was the cause of the focal neurological deficits? Was it only vascular, infectious, both, or neither? And finally, what was the terminal event? So the patient having predominantly unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia do, does suggest that either the bilirubin was high due to more breakdown of the uh, our blood, red, 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 uh, red blood cells, suggestive of hemolytic anemia, or because the conjugation was less. But still, I mean, uh, these six, seven diagnoses were being considered repeatedly when the patient was uh, under uh, treatment. So of these, I would like, I want to state that because the bilirubinemia was predominantly unconjugated, Dubin-Johnson syndrome was probably, it can be ruled out. And also because the patient never developed a very big spinomegaly, at least earlier in the course, the non-serotic portal hypertension should be ruled out. More so now that we have a report of next-gen sequencing, probably the patient was having a secondary iron overload and maybe some contribution by the Gilbert syndrome because the patient was found subsequently to be having heterozygous missense variation in the uh, UGTA gene. Going over to hemolytic anemia. Now, the patient was considered to be having immune-related hemolytic anemia, but the workup was repeatedly negative, and there was no response to immunomodulation, and rather the patient deteriorated after getting immunomodulation. So it is less likely that the patient was having an immune-related hemolytic anemia. Rather, the common causes which are considered for a chronic hemolytic anemia would be hemoglobinopathies, red cell membrane disorders, or red cell enzyme disorders. Now, in this patient also, despite a very avid workup, no um, diagnosis could be made for a chronic hemolytic anemia, and this does represent a very large chunk of an uncharacterized hemolytic anemia for which the diagnosis has to rest on next-gen sequencing, which is available now, and so was there in this patient who was subsequently diagnosed to be having dehydrated hereditary stomatocytosis or, de or hereditary xerocytosis. I would just want to state two, three points over here for this condition. This is a condition of compensated hemolysis. Patient has chronic hemolysis. Patient has hyperbilirubinemia, but most importantly, the patient is under a condition of heavy iron overload because of this erythropoiesis. Again, importantly, these are the patients who are never transfused, never given blood, but still they develop iron overload. So this is the significance of this condition. The another important thing is that these patients often have a lack of correlation between the ferritin level and the iron overload, again telling that the, the ferritin levels can be falsely reassuring, and the patient might be going on a very heavy iron load all this while. This patient also had other mutations, UGTA mutation, as I just pointed out, which could have been contributory in causing unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia in this particular case. And the patient also had other mutations, which might have just contributed to uh, causing stomatocytosis and hence hemolysis. The third phase was that of atrial fibrillation. The patient had biatrial enlargement with diastolic dysfunction. Uh, with normal ejection fraction. So this just suggests that the patient was probably having restrictive cardiomyopathy, and it is highly likely that this patient was also having hemochromatosis of the heart. Moving over, the patient developed focal neurological deficits. Now, importantly, the first episode which was there was in the background of a probable restrictive cardiomyopathy with probable uh, causation of thromboebolic events and a cardiac conduction defect, which just suggests that the patient might be having a cardiovascular uh, event at this time, again in, an, uh, in a background of iron overload, which is itself thrombotic. So though there was a po possibility of this patient having purely vascular event, but importantly, where was the vascular event? The vascular event was in the territory of ventriculostriate territory. And along with that, as, just was, as was shown by Dr. Chirag, that there were even other lesions which were not having diffusion restriction. So though there were a few lesions which were having diffusion restriction, there were other hyperintensities without diffusion restriction, and these, these uh, other uh, hyperintensities were also contrast enhancing, not just ring-like contrast enhancement like we see in subacute infarcts, but there were other lesions which were having disc-like enhancement, nodular enhancement, and along with that there was a component of meningeal enhancement, nodular meningeal enhancement, even subtle uh, shaggy uh, cisternal areas and some mild hydrocephalus. So was it only vascular event? Probably no. The patient was having a significant contribution by mening meningitis, and hence the inflammatory component was predominant. Though infectious causes would remain first in the mind because of the patient's underlying immunocompromised status, patient received steroids, Mycophenolate mofetil, azathioprine, was having a long-standing hepatic disease, iron overload, and a very low CD4 count. I probably would consider infectious cause as the first uh, differential in this patient. Endocarditis, very little evidence. Restrictive cardiomyopathy should not cause it. So probably it was primary meningoencephalitis. So there's a host of infections which can cause this condition. I would just...
to highlight a few of them. Uh, bacterial infections, procalcitonin was very high in this patient, and around 25% of bacterial meningitis can have a vascular involvement. More so, streptococcal pneumoniae can have around 30% of patients which go into vasculitis. Tuberculosis, around 57 patients who are in stage 3. This patient was also almost in a comatose state. So 57% patients can develop. And even nocardiosis, similar picture could have occurred. It's very difficult to state at the moment with the given evidence whether it was nocardiosis or not. But tuberculosis at least remains high on cards. Stroke and syphilis, though it also causes meningovascular infarct. It causes uvenous arthritis. But the patient's background was not... Uh, suggestive of syphilis or neurosyphilis. So probably these possibilities I'm not considering. Again, viral possibilities not considering because, because the patient was not having hemorrhages. Viral usually causes large vessel, large vessel involvement, not the small vessels or the lenticular territory involvement which was there in this particular patient. Parasitic infection, very difficult to comment on this scenario with the given evidence. Again, cerebral toxoplasmosis, probably no, because again, in toxoplasmosis, it is very rare to have infarct. So I'm, I put it over here, why? Because basal ganglia, thalamic region, one would often think in case ring enhancing lesions are there in this area, so why is toxoplasmosis not a cause, especially in immunocompromised background? So there were no infarct, so probably no toxoplasmosis. So as they say, the proof of the pudding is in, is in the eating. So this patient had evidence... Uh, adequate evidence to suggest that there was positive triprococcal antigen. This culture report was collected posthumously, and the patient was having high beta-glucan levels. So even in cryptococcal meningitis, around 25% in FOX, 28% can cause meningitis, and then there can be around 20% of pseudocysts or cryptococcomas, and it has a pretty high mortality rate. So probably cryptococcal meningitis is first uh, differential in this patient with the given scenario. The patient was little immunocompromised, so hence the gross picture of a gross hydrocephalus and lots of inflammation in the form of exudates might have been missing in this case. And then because iron is essential, trace, uh, trace metal necessary for reproduction of That's fungal pathogens. Yes, sir. Almost over, sir. And hence, uh, it might have led on to facilitation. I would directly come on to this final slide of mine. I feel that iron overload condition was already present in this patient due to hemolytic anemia, which caused cardiac and hepatic damage. Steroids probably were the tipping point which led on to immunocompromised state, which was already being contributed in the background due to the hepatic involvement and the cardiomyopathy and also thrombosis involvement. In the background of iron overload, the patient's body had an adequate substrate to develop a cryptococcal uh, meningovasculitis, and that is my final diagnosis, hemolytic anemia due to hereditary xerocytosis, hemochromatosis with probable uh, some element of Gilbert's, cardiac hemochromatosis and meningovasculitis due to multiple lacunar infarcts, cryptococcal meningovasculitis. Co-infections could be there, but at least the evidence of cryptococcus is there, and aspiration pneumonitis was the terminal event in this patient. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Asta. Please come and join me here. Now, this is a very interesting case, and uh, to begin with straight, uh, we have uh, Dr. Ajay. Uh, would you please comment on the liver disease straight, you know, what we are dealing with? Is it a primary uh, iron overload state, or is it a secondary uh, iron overload, which is producing CLD, because it's going on for 20 years? So, what is your possible? Uh, sir, not only 20 years, we have been following this patient for almost 30 years. When I was resident, 92, initially, Dr. Chavla was looking after, then I started looking after him for almost 10, 15 years. So I think three issues on him. Initially, I think we thought that the diagnosis was straightforward as a hereditary hemochromatosis because of the high ferritin, high saturation, liver biopsy showing uh, iron in the hepatocytes. It was not hemosiderosis or the iron in the Kaffir cells. It was in the hepatocytes. So we thought the iron, this, the diagnosis was clear. He was put on phlebotomy. He was put on iron chelators. But then he became anemic. And then the second problem was, and uh, at that time, uh, HFE was negative, which we normally see in these patients. But then that time, you know, these piezo mutations and all were not known, and this came only after 2010. So put it short, I think now we think that since he went on to have anemia, hemolysis, probably his hematological diagnosis is a hereditary xerocytosis, which has been confirmed on a piezo mutation now. So that's fine. The unconjugated hyperbilinemia is probably a combination no, no, I, of... No, no, I just want to ask, you know, this person was undergoing so, phlebotomy. So, so a person of hemolytic anemia, why should he undergo phlebotomy? So, so I'm coming to that, sir. Yeah. So the second was the unconjugated hyperbilinemia, which I thought was a combination of hemolysis, and maybe he could have a UGTA1, uh, which could be, you know, heterozygous, but then he could have a comp of Gilbert syndrome, so a combination, because normally the Gilberts or hemolysis alone will have a bilirubin less than five. Here the bilirubin had gone even up to seven, eight many a times. 
But the third most important problem in this patient was the portal hypertension, which actually came later on. He had large viruses, but you know, fibroscan is a kind of stetho for us. His fibroscan has always been around six, seven in a non serotic range. So it was definitely a non serotic portal hypertension. It was not chronic liver disease, number one. What was the cause of non serotic portal hypertension is difficult because it did not fit into the NCPF like, you know, presentation, big spleen, age, and even the histology. So I'll put it as some kind of vascular injury, maybe say nodular regenerative hyperplasia, NRH happening because of some vasculopathy. He had a systemic disease going on, leading on to portal hypertension. I think that's probably the reason. So I think hemochromatosis is out. It is probably xerocytosis, uh, unconjugated because of Gilbert and all, and maybe it was a non serotic maybe NRH plus minus NCPF. Yes, now the second issue was naturally hematology. So anybody would like to take, Dr. Pankaj, would you like to take? So why was this person undergoing phlebotomy is my point, straightforward. You know, were we inducing anemia in a patient of hemolytic anemia or what exactly? So he was having compensated hemolysis and unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. The phlebotomies were done to take out the iron from the body. It was not, you know, for the diagnosis of hemolytic anemia was never made. You know, it is only now we have a next generation sequencing available that the diagnosis is made. So we must see the patient in perspective. In 1992 when this patient came, Unconjugated uh, hyper. Was for was iron, for iron overload. Yes. There was a iron, no? hemochromatosis. Wow. That is the, you, we don't have so many drugs to take out the iron from the body. So that's why the phlebotomies were done. That is the reason. And for uh, dehydrated uh, stomatocytosis, uh, the, there is, uh, splenectomy is not the treatment here. This is, you know, as opposed to the other hemolytic anemia where you can do the splenectomy. So this is what the, the problem is. And I'm actually, Happy at least the final the diagnosis was made. Even, you know, this patient has given us enough time to make the diagnosis with the current available investigations. Yes, any, uh, yes, Dr. Inder. Yeah, you know, the third issue was uh, naturally related to uh, heart, you know. Can I see any cardiologist so, uh, to comment on the cardiomyopathy? Yes. I think uh, me and uh, Siddharth were discussing that uh, the plasma HP level was elevated in... Uh, 92 and 2005 so initially it was elevated retic counts were elevated i wonder why a possibility of uh, hemolysis was not considered then so do we have a cardiologist to comment on the heart issue because you know we have to delay it. there are five organs and i believe that uh, brain was the was was this person given any immunosuppression any times yes, 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 oh so, uh, so the first thing is so this patient was having normal reticulocyte counts early. If you see my uh, notes, in the first 1992 to 2005, retics count, retic count was just 3%. So at that time, it was not that elevated. And subsequently, the reticulocyte counts were elevated. One. Two, uh, sir, what was the second question? Sorry. Immunosuppression. Yeah. So yes, the patient did receive immunosuppression. And the immunosuppression was given, thinking that the patient was having immune hemolytic anemia. He received immunosuppression right from November 2021 till March. Till that time, he developed fever and he developed hemiparesis. So till that time, he was receiving high uh, immunosuppression. Uh, steroids were there and even mycophenolate was given up to 2.5 grams in this patient. Now, I do not know how much was the dose of azathioprine, but at least azathioprine was mentioned in the notes. So I believe both all these three agents, I mean steroids plus mycophenolate plus azathioprine would have caused a considerable immunosuppression. Sir, the CD4 count was only 5.6%. You know, my point was cryptococcal meningitis. When we have it, you can have it in patients who are immunocompromised versus competent. That's why I was asking, yes. you know, whether it's a liver disease which is predisposing or whether it's a steroids or okay. any other immunosuppression. It's probably multifactorial yes. was there, sir. In the terminal phase, I think the patient definitely had iron overload, which can either predispose to many fungal infections. Since the beta-glucan was also elevated, we can also consider other fungal like uh, Canada also. And regarding the cardiac event, the patient did have, if you see the x-ray, he had a straightened left heart border, which is suggestive of a left atrial enlargement. He could also have a cardiogenic pulmonary edema with a uh, right-sided pleural effusion, which was seen in the terminal phase. Yes. I also yes. said that. So this uh, confusion with uh, um, immune hemolysis is not uncommon in patients with undiagnosed congenital hemolytic anemias because of their transfusions, sometimes they end up getting a positive DCT. And because we're still groping around for a diagnosis, they get, get given trials of immunosuppression suppressants just to see if they'll respond. Yes, Siddharth. Please, please come forward. 
Sir, I think considering the chest X-ray findings uh, and the patient's background immunosuppression, I feel it's not just cryptocoal, it's a polymicrobial infection. Secondly, the CD4 I don't think needs to be interpreted in this setting. The patient is in sepsis and these CD4 values have no meaning at all. Yes. You know, RN has a very specific tendency with the MUPA because MUPA, MUPA needs uh, RN. So the strokes that were there were lenticular stride vessels on both sides with one hemispheric cerebellar. So suggestive of cardiomolic, like ma'am said. But hemochromatosis, to my knowledge, causes more of a dilated cardiomyopathy with biventricular enlargement. So biarterial enlargement would make me look for the valves very specifically. At 70, you can still have non-valvular FA with uh, this, but with such background. Terminal event is sepsis. These strokes don't cause mortality. So I All think right. both the component, uh, so, so this hemochromatosis can cause both dilated as well as infiltrative or restrictive cardiomyopathy. And yes, you are right that the patient was under a background of thrombosis or a card or embolic, thromboembolic events which could have occurred, which could have taken place. And one last thing is that the patient could also have as terminal event, I've written over there but did not speak in the wake of time, that pulmonary thromboembolism could also have been one of the precipitating causes in this patient. Like was already mentioned, the patient is having a thromboembolic background plus severe sepsis. I think these two things... All right, very nice, you know, at least uh, you could uh, knit the whole thing and say that it was possibly a milder form of congenital hemolytic anemia which was ongoing, which over a period of time produced iron overload, liver disease, then steroids, and then cryptococcal. I believe that's the way we would like to... Yes. So let's see now what we have to see. And uh, I would invite Dr. Bishan. Dr. Bishan is known to show us fungus. I am sure that at least he'll show one, maybe more. Thank you, uh, Professor Sanjay. Well, the intention was not to show any fungus. I didn't have a CPC case, and Dr. Umana lent me one of these. And she had uh, initially kept it for herself. But then um, uh, I'm grateful that she had earlier worked up this case. So uh, since uh, uh, a neurologist is doing CPC and Astha is there, I will start my uh, uh, my my presentation with the brain itself and keep it aside, then go to the liver. Uh, so uh, I think uh, brain weight was uh, 1388 grams. Uh, this is the left lateral surface. Is it does not show any uh, exudate. Just a little bit of pooling of the CSF. One can confuse it with that pooling of CSF, and uh, uh, the. Uh, right lateral surface again, little bit, but there was no purulent exudate, or one couldn't say even exudate. So I think I'll show you all the surfaces. Uh, this is the superior surface and the inferior surface. The superior surface shows little bit of uh, thickened arachnoid villi, which is age-related change. The inferior surface that does not show any basal exudate. The, you can see the cranial nerves, optic uh, chiasma, optic nerve, and a kilometer nerve and even the surface of the base is pontis. So no significant exudate. Uh, on slicing, there was little bit of, I would say, very marginal dilatation of the lateral ventricle, but uh, as such, there was no infarction noted anywhere in any of the territories. And I'll show you the close-up of some of these. Uh, I'll show you a close-up of uh, uh, this area. And uh, this area shows uh, if you see this area shows anterior, uh, anterior commissure, there is a whitish lesion uh, surrounded by a little bit of uh, maybe congestion. And uh, this is right in the uh, way of the internal capsule. Uh, no significant uh, basal meningitis. And again here, uh, what I'm trying to show you is that uh, there was another uh, uh, focus which was uh, soft and granular. There were some other foci here involving, involving the uh, globus pallidus. And there was, therefore, on both sides, there were, uh, again, here, you know, the thalamus was involved. Uh, both the uh, internal capsule on this side was showing this uh, brownish areas are softening. And they were, the maximum was about one centimeter uh, in its uh, m m uh, dimensions. And uh, the, another one, the little uh, at the level of the pulmonar of thalamus, uh, white matter lesion, which was in fact slightly depressed. Uh, the, I didn't find any um, focal lesion in the cerebellum and the pons, but I think 
I need to go back to see in the left cerebellum which Chirag has shown, which may not be obvious on uh, this one centimeter slices. Uh, microscopic examination showed meningitis. Uh, uh, this uh, had uh, uh, predominantly lymphocyte, plasma cell, and histocytes, and uh, some giant cells, and a special stain showed these cryptococci uh, within the uh, uh, subarachnoid space and within the giant cells. So again, this is the meninges over the midbrain, showing you uh, meningitis, predominantly histocytic response, and low magnification, and giant cells, multinucleate giant cells. Uh, cerebellum also showed, but these were focal areas showing cerebellar folia, showing this uh, meningeal infiltrate. Uh, I don't say they're fi fine, uh, forming granulomas, but many multinucleate giant cells, they were also containing the uh, this is again uh, medulla, ventral surface of the medulla, and uh, the blessed, blood vessels are congested, and you see the same type of exudate. So there was cryptococcal meningitis. Now I go to the um, basal ganglia lesions, which I showed grossly. They were of uh, various sizes. Uh, this is one of the largest one. They showed some cystic uh, uh, cavities also, and uh, this is the same area, uh, this one, under higher magnification. You see a lot of uh, macrophages and uh, some degenerative, uh, de de degenerative cells, inflammatory cells. And uh, if you see the close-up of this is the other side, which showed confluent, confluent uh, lesions, which were very well circumscribed, some vascular changes and uh, reactive changes in and around. And then you see vascular proliferation. So there were these, uh, 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 this is an area which shows uh, well circumscribed, I mean, demarcated from the, uh, uh, so the parent chyma, and in these areas, uh, ill-formed granulomas were noted, predominantly centered around the vessels, and then a lot of giant cells. Here, I think you can see some of these uh, cryptococci, but I, I'll show you in special special stains. Uh, so another one, which shows uh, cryptococci within the giant cells, perivascular lymphocytic infiltration, uh, a bit of necrosis. And then uh, the arteries within the parenchyma, the arteries uh, in the meninges were normal. The arteries within the parenchyma showed that uh, there were uh, granulomas around the vessels, around these arteries, but the arterial wall was not infected. There was no endothelial proliferation. So basically, paravascular granulomas were there. And these were uh, 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 loaded with the cryptococci. And these are, this is a PA stain. And there, there was a little bit of fibrosis in these, uh, some of these sections. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to show you that uh, only one vessel showed uh, some changes of vascular involvement. This is another feature which is noted. Uh, this is highline PS positive, highline change around the arterioles reported from limb hands. And you see these again, cryptococci. So this is a photograph from the uh, TBM case. So uh, what I'm trying to show you is that in TBM, it is vascular wall which is uh, actually involved, shows intimal, uh, these are the typical lesions, the TBM. So these are, because last CPC also we had this confusion. So I told that, I was telling that uh, these uh, histologically, it, it is easy, uh, clinically and uh, um, imaging wise, it may be difficult. But uh, if you have typical lesions of, this is a pan arteritis, this is a necrotizing arteritis, this is ovulative arteritis, so this is typically what is seen in the TBM and this was not seen. In this case, what is what was seen was uh, this type of lesion, the para um, arterial granulomas. So I think I finished, so in those cystic areas, there were almost cultures of this cryptococci, so these were uh, forming cryptococcomas with uh, presence of lot of mucoid uh, material uh, around the organisms and some cystic cavities. This is a PS stain, this is a mucic carmine, alcium blue, and PS alcium blue combined. So, and some uh, macrophage reaction, etc. The basal ganglia also showed uh, uh, the microvascular calcification. So, I think I finished uh, uh, my brain findings here. Uh, coming to the liver, which was the next uh, important problem in this case, this is the biopsy. I didn't have, I couldn't get access of the 1992 liver biopsies. Uh, it was not available in the record. But this is the latest, uh, last biopsy done in 2017, where portal fibrosis, hemochromatosis, and 
possibly Gilbert was um, reported. So this biopsy shows uh, portal fibrosis, of course. The rest of the parenchyma did not show any, uh, any damage. And uh, uh, it is uh, uh, demonstrated on the mesentrichrome stain, uh, retic. And then uh, this uh, hemocidin pigment was demonstrated there. I think there was another slide which showed uh, this mesen fontana, but I am not sure whether this is a kind of right kind of state. It is again in the same areas and very coarsely granular pigment. Usually melanin pigment is very fine and blackish in color. So I think probably it was also same. So that's why it was reported as portal fibrosis, hemochromatosis, because that time it was all hemochromatosis which was going on. Now we know that it is hemocytosis. So therefore, even in heart, which I'll come back to, we are, if we have a diagnosis of hemocytosis, then uh, hemochromatosis in heart doesn't come and uh, restrictive or related cardiomyopathy will not arise. So I just wanted to make it clear. The, at, at a topsy, uh, the main thing was that labor was, I would say, it, the weight mentioned was 815. I didn't have all the slices to confirm it, but this is uh, okay, normal or near normal. But the weight of the spleen was 830, so it was massively involved. And you see the size of the spleen was almost the same. The gallbladder was there, the, uh, the prosector had noticed and the organ reviewer had noticed that there was black pigmentation, pigmented stones within the gallbladder. One was stuck in the cystic duct and then there were others which the largest measured one centimeter in diameter. So there were pigment stones. Uh, the pancreas here is uh, grossly normal. Uh, we have dissected the, so these are the liver slices to show that there was no nodularity. Inferior vena cava and hepatic veins did not show any thrombosis. So there was no obvious nodularity on the surface as well as on the cut surface. So uh, dissection of the portal vein showed that this was massively dilated. Uh, dissection of the portal uh, splenic vein also showed that it was, it was dilated. Uh, this is the uh, bile duct which was normal and you can see here the hepatic uh, uh, arteries. There was some uh, portal fibrosis in those areas. This is the scanning uh, uh, view of the liver parenchyma. This is the photograph from the deep parenchyma aerotopsy section. So you can see that the grossly the architecture is not really distorted, but you can still see that there was some portal fibrosis. And this is confirmed, this is one area which was showing the maximum. So I took the photo from the photograph from there. So this shows collagenous stroma in the portal tract with maybe formation of uh, pseudolobules, etc., etc. And But no uh, complete nodules or cirrhotic nodules because there was no regeneration. Uh, uh, this was again confirmed with the reticle stain. Uh, now coming on to the portal tracts, which was actually uh, during antimortem biopsies also and here. This is what you see in a normal portal tract. So you have bile duct and you have a small uh, portal um, uh, artery tributary and then the portal vein. Many of these smaller portal tracts in this liver were showing obliteration and the disappearance of the portal vein radicals. So intrahepatic portal vein radicals were missing. You see, some of them were just dilated and very thin-walled. Uh, some of them were showing angiomatoid transformation and then portal, portal bridging, a little bit of inflammation here and there. And uh, this is another one which is showing a close-up. You have um, uh, bile ductules, but there is portal fibrosis and disappearance of the uh, portal vein radical. The larger portal veins did not show any uh, disappearance or significant narrowing. Uh, this is another photograph to show. So looking at this, there are a lot of hemocytin pigment around this. Looking at this, we also thought that this patient might be having some drugs or something like that. So arsenic was probably thought, but uh, and the tissue was sent for arsenic measurements. I haven't got the report. When I get, I'll share it with you. So, uh, and then, you know, the other features in this case was that inlet venules, they were uh, dilated in the, uh, with the uh, in the uh, periportal areas, uh, the what has happened? It's not moving far. Okay, the periportal area also shows these mega sinusoids. This is also one of the changes which is reported that the periportal sinusoids were really dilated and very uh, very large vascular channels. So this is the portal tract, and this was very prominent everywhere. And the sinusoids were dilated everywhere, severely congested. And the pearl stain showed uh, periportal deposition of the hemocytin pigment, and this is uh, the close-up of the same uh, massive. Uh, it was 
again i would say that it was not only in the kufar cells but in hepatocytes and uh, this is uh, the um, photograph showing you the dilated uh, gyle canaliculi and uh, this is the feature which i am told is called as cholangitis lenta and is seen in septicemic livers so and uh, the section from the gallbladder also showed some biliary uh, sludge here of the pigmented uh, nature and uh, there was no significant cholecystitis but uh, these uh, as a, the part of the stones here there. the spleen showed uh, is a massively enlarged 830 grams it showed uh, a large infarct uh, wedge shaped infarct which was whitish surrounded by uh, the hemorrhagic areas about 4 cm in the maximum dimension perisplenitis thick perisplenitis was present uh, which was confirmed microscopically the uh, white pulp was reduced to very little and surrounded by very significant uh, 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 red pulp congestion uh, the white is not moving forward anyway can you move it from there please it is not moving from here okay so infected areas showed uh, uh, all these necrotic vessels and the gamma antibodies were plenty which showed the presence of uh, this iron as well as calcium uh, and tallies very well with the with, with the uh, imaging findings and some of these veins they showed thrombi uh, within this uh, pulmonary pain gamma the pancreas showed the normal islets uh, the uh, ductules were normal except for the fact that the pancreas showed little bit of uh, i could find only in few areas some hemosiderin pigment here within the within the alveolar uh, within the sinus cells the kidney the uh, aorta is perfectly fine uh, very clean the kidneys were normal size normal weight ureters were fine and uh, you know the microscopic section showed uh, normal glomeruli there was no cortical infarction but and uh, this is a panel of photographs to show you that psy is yeah, glomerular didn't show any changes the only change was the significant uh, uh, congestion and the some plasma aggregation and rbcs within the moment capsule uh, uh, this was uh, to show you uh, significant congestion of the peritubular capillaries uh, and uh, severe atn changes with loss of nuclei and and this was focal in areas Uh, interstitial inflammation was noted uh, intertubular calcification was noted uh, elastic reduplication in the medium and small size arteries was noted as a feature of hypertension uh, heart was uh, normal and uh, except for there was left ventricular hypertrophy 1.5 cm the other chambers were normal uh, microscopically uh, there was nothing except there was no iron overload the uh, there was nucleomegaly in some of the areas uh, coronaries were dissected they were normal uh, lungs was uh, i think severely involved uh, this is the uh, sorry this is the uh, right lung and left lung right was more prominently involved with lot of pleuritis and thick pleura both uh, lungs showed uh, patches of hemorrhagic discoloration and uh, you know this pleuritis was very prominent in the uh, right upper lobe with lot of neutrophils uh, this is the pleura and uh, see there was evidence of aspiration pneumonia with lot of keratins and gram positive bacterial colonies uh, the other area showed presence of these granomas um, containing uh, these giant cells and within these giant cells lot of cryptococci were there so there was pulmonary cryptococcosis uh, and the grocot stain uh, the rest of the lung showed extensive uh, bronchopneumonia with the alveoli filled with exudate and some uh, uh, sh uh, shedding of the bronchial mucosa and even necrotizing type of uh, um, these uh, small fibrin thrombi and uh, diffuse alveolar damage was also noted and these are i am sure these are terminal stages the gut this uh, uh, esophagus was really um, bile stained otherwise uh, the uh, stomach gut showed this congestion and uh, sections were taken this showed cleft uh, um, varices the wall of the small gut as well as the large gut showed 
a um, uh, lot of myocytolysis as a result of terminal, hy terminal hypoxia. And I think that the last slide, uh, adenine was normal. Bone marrow showed uh, significant erythroid hyperplasia, and I think I'll stop here. Because... So this uh, autopsy diagnosis is in a known case of hereditary xerocytosis, liver which shows features consistent with NCPF, and there is hemosiderosis, and there was a lot of centrizone hemorrhagic necrosis as a terminal finding, pulmonary cryptococcosis, aspiration pneumonia, bronchopneumonia, uh, there was diffuse alveolar damage. There is cryptococcal meningitis with bilateral uh, basal ganglia cryptococcomas. So there is, uh, sorry, there is uh, ATN, uh, splenic infarcts, the pigment stones in the gallbladder, and bone marrow with thread hyplasia. Thank you. Please come and join me here. So naturally, the first pause would be that, uh, you know, first point would be that what is the cause of this portal hypertension? Is it NCPF? Yes, Dr. Ajay. So you have to answer this. You know, typically we are taught that NCPF is a disease of middle-aged ladies who have got splenomegaly, portal hypertension, recurrent bleeds. So here we have elderly male going on for 30 years. So, sir, yeah, I think this is what I said, uh, you know, after the clinical protocol. Clinically, he would not fit into NCPF, but then we, I agreed that this was definitely a non-serotic portal hypertension. Because as I said, you know, the never decompensation, he had viruses, and the uh, LSM, and even we did the RF, which is another form of elastography, they were all near normal. So they were, he was a definitely a non-serotic portal hypertension. To call it as NCPF, I will still have my reservations because, as you said, the age, the gender, the size of the spleen doesn't really fit into that. Uh, there's another new terminology which has come now, which is called as PSVD or portosinusoidal vascular disease, where, you know, they, they have grouped all these patients, those who come with, with or without portal hypertension and this kind of, you know, morphology, they are calling it as PSVD. So I think you could fit into that. So it's a non-serotic portal hypertension, PSVD or anything, not typical NCPF. Uh, the other learning point is, as I said, you know, the zero cytosis is one entity which we have learned now can have hemoglobins which can be supranormal to the extent making you think like hemochromatosis, but still on, at the same time they could be hemolyzing. So in one time they could be supranormal HB and they may become anemic. So this is what happened in this particular patient. I think that's a typical story. And the I think the uh, unconjugated thing probably was. The, my, my only question, sir, to you is the iron again, was it in the Kuffer cells, or was it in the hepatocytes to call it as hemosidrosis or hemochromatosis, or was it both? No, I think uh, the most of the iron was in the hepatocytes. There was not much iron in the Kuffer cells. So, yeah. And I, I think the, as far as the age is concerned, if this patient, this patient did not develop uh, uh, portosinusoidal veno, venous disease uh, now, it must have developed 20 years ago or 10 years ago, so the age was that time different. So I think, I mean, there may be uh, difficulties, but I could, the best fit I could offer was this one. So I didn't know about this photo sign, so I haven't read it, so I, I'll read it again. Marina, can you comment, you know, do we really need NGS on morphology? We cannot talk of, of uh, stomatocytosis or xerocytosis, or uh, there is so much of difficulty that, uh, you know, yeah. it takes so, us 20 uh, years to diagnose this condition. Yeah, so this gene itself was diagnosed, uh, was uh, identified just in 2013. The protein was diagnosed, uh, was, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, 2010 only. And uh, the people who discovered it actually got the Nobel Prize for the PISO-1, uh, that uh, the mechano uh, uh, receptor. So what I wanted to actually say is that where the mutation is also important, here it was a gain-of-function mutation because the entire protein is intact. It's at the carboxy terminal that you get the mutation, where it behaves like an autosomal dominant condition. But if you get a loss of mutation, which is autosomal recessive, then uh, the patient will behave as an overhydrated stomatocytosis. Stomatocytic disorders itself we are able to identify in the last 10 years or so. Uh, and there are multiple genes which are involved, which is why NGS is necessary. And why it is also necessary is that we cannot do a splenectomy in the cases. Because if you have hemolytic anemias where you know, the spleen remo is removed and the patient behaves fine, fine. But in stomatocytic disorders, it's dangerous to do a splenectomy because the patients can end up with thrombosis. And uh, the recognition that patients can present as hereditary hemochromatosis is also in the last 10 years that the reports are there. 
because of the fact that the gut doesn't know what is the cause. Like if anemia is there, the gut is going to just keep on absorbing iron. So now we have uh, among the earlier cases of uh, hereditary hemochromatosis, which Dr. Chavla was following, we had one case who died of uh, congenital dyserythropoietic anemia. And yesterday, actually, another patient has come with iron overload. And she's, she was born in 93. And now she has iron overload with the congenital dyserythropoietic anemia. No, my so point was very simple. On morphology, at least you can say somatocytosis. So if you can see that probably the morphology was not looked at, and I would say that, you know, it, you need very astute clinicians to guide uh, the, us also, because uh, it was Dr. Dipesh Ladd in the OPD in 2016 when he gave a call and said that this patient has some problem of hemolysis and please have a look at the smear, where actually uh, we could make out that something is wrong and that there was reticulocytosis. I think the diagnosis once made, it keeps on just going in the card. So that's what happened in this particular case for so many years. And we missed the Nobel Prize. No, I don't think we are at that Dr. level. Sanjay, <laughs> Dr. Sanjay, <laughs> yeah. shall we still call it hemochromatosis? Why should we call it hemochromatosis at the moment also? We know the diagnosis. Hemocytosis. Hemocytosis. That's what I'm saying. So the, bringing the point that this is hemochromatosis and doesn't fit into this liver. There was no actually iron stored in the bone marrow. In this case, in the pan, in the pancreas, liver, kidney. Uh, sorry, liver. Apart from liver, there was nothing. Not in the heart. So now I think we clearly know it, that this is not hemochromatosis. Thank yeah, you. Asta, you wanted to say something. Sir, just as a physician, when I was discussing this patient with uh, Dr. Ditya and Dr. Lakshman, who helped me a lot in preparing this case, what I realized was that there's a very big chunk, like Ma'am was saying, of anemias which are never diagnosed, and NGS is probably the only answer. If I did not have NGS, probably I would not have retrospectively thought of all the diagnosis which was made. So probably in this chunk, uncharacterized hemolytic right, anemia we needed. Uh, I want to ask, uh, sir, basically there was huge dilatation of sinusoids you mentioned. Was there any obstruction post uh, hepatic venules or somewhere? And uh, you know the fibrosis is consistent with non-serotic PSVDs which we diagnose. And again, uh, if it is a hemolytic anemia, again why the iron is going into the hepatocytes? It's unclear. Maybe there is an additional mutation in the, you know, the iron pathway, uh, which is undiagnosed. I, I think there, there was no obstruction in the hepatic veins, and we have dissected the portal vein, hepatic vein, except for the splenic uh, tributaries of the splenic vein. There was no thrombosis. So at the moment, there was no thrombosis. At some stage, it was there, I can't say. The other thing is that, yes, typically the iron is loaded in the periportal hepatocytes. Sorry, hepatocytes rather than the, and I have looked it very carefully uh, among eight, ten sections, and the findings are typically the same. Yes, the, actually, I have read the paper by Dr. Serene and Chavala and Demon. So, the, so all these findings are described there. You know, the findings are very variable in NC. The, they begin by saying that the uh, liver histology, eritopsy, and wedge biopsies, the liver biopsies, they are described very nicely. So, they are variable. So the best thing I could fit was that this is the, what I can say. But I think the, as Dr. Ajay is saying, there are other terminologies are also coming. Previously, it used to be called as portal venous uh, cholangiopathy, uh, portal venous uh, something, uh, so portal obstructive something like that, by paper by uh, Ramalinga Swami and the Nayak Saab. But the changes, uh, they, they do come up. Yes, they are. 30 seconds, please. Yeah. You know, we have at least four or five. Just wanted to say there was a lot of dirty looking pleuritis and perisplenitis. So were we able to isolate any other organism and were these panic infarcts bland or infected? So what took away was uh, cryptococcus. We know that iron overload uh, does predispose to cryptococcus. So extent of iron overload, obviously steroids and MMF was probably somewhere we erred in this case. Uh, so my question was, pituitary is one organ where which is the earliest to uh, have the deposition and it uh, also affects the immune axis. So c could we look at, at uh, autopsy yes. or on MRI? Yes, I have, I have looked at the pituitary. There was no iron overload and there was no infection. And as far as spleen is concerned, this is not infective. There was hypersplenism, you know, portal veins uh, obstructed, hypersplenism, the infarcts are known. This is not infective. 
So I'm not worried about liver, but what about kidneys? Chronic hemolysis and we are having no iron in uh, uh, kidneys because generally whenever we have hemolytic anemia, we do see iron uh, deposit, deposited in kidneys. So here I was thinking because of stomatocytosis, which is kind of a structural abnormality of RBCs, it's behaving like a sickle cell disease where it's clogging your uh, glomeruli as well as PTCs, which are kind of... Uh, causing ischemia to the proximal tubules where this iron is probably getting deposited and lost very fast. So that is what we were hypothesizing. That was our hypothesis.